Hello everyone, this is going to be the first in a series of five videos that I'm planning on the quantum harmonic oscillator. So we're going to solve the Schrodinger equation in the specific case of a harmonic potential. This is quite a difficult thing to do and it's quite time consuming, which is why I'm splitting it over uh, five videos. But uh, let's just have a look at the equation we're going to solve. We've got the general Schrodinger equation up at the top left, minus h bar squared over 2m d2 psi by dx squared plus v times psi equals e psi. Uh, in this particular case of a harmonic potential, we're going to say v as a function of x is half m omega squared x squared. Now, half m omega squared is just some constant. So you might think, well, why not just call that v equals kx squared or something like that to make it simpler? And that would be a perfectly valid thing to do, and it wouldn't change the underlying physics. We could still go through and solve it in terms of k. But there are two reasons, I think, for writing it as half m omega squared x squared. Um, one is sort of by analogy with classical mechanics. So if you have a classical particle of mass m in this potential half m omega squared x squared, then it will oscillate with an angular frequency of, of omega. So omega has that nice interpretation in the classical case. And so um, we kind of extend that and just go with the same convention for the quantum mechanical case. The other reason is simply because it makes the solution come out very nicely. So as we'll see, um, the uh, in particular the energies that we that we get from solving this uh, the Schrodinger equation can be expressed very ne neatly in terms of omega and so it just makes the solution look a little bit nicer. So why is this actually a useful exercise to go through? Well for one thing it's one of the few potentials for which you can actually solve the Schrodinger equation exactly so it's interesting for that reason but also if you just consider some general potential function maybe I'll just do a little sketch here so this is going to be our v-axis and our x-axis V and X. Let's say you're interested in two atoms interacting with each other. So um, the interatomic potential looks something like this, where it goes down to a minimum and then uh, goes off to zero and infinite separation. But the idea is, if you're interested in the behavior of your system near uh, near its equilibrium position, in other words, where the potential is a minimum down here, you can approximate the potential near the minimum as a quadratic function. So I'll try to just sketch that on. Um, you know, you could have some quadratic function that looks something like that. Um, and so the behavior of many systems close to equilibrium is approximately uh, that of a harmonic oscillator. And so uh, solving the quantum harmonic oscillator allows us to get some idea of sort of the general uh, behavior of many quantum mechanical systems. So enough introduction, let's get on with actually solving this equation. The first thing we're going to do um, is sort of the conventional first step in, uh, in solving this, this Schrodinger equation, which is to rescale the variables in such a way that a lot of the constants that we have here um, disappear and therefore we make the algebra a lot easier for the uh, the remaining steps. So what I'm going to do is firstly um, just multiply my whole equation by uh, minus 2m over h bar squared to make that prefactor in front of our derivative disappear. So if I do that uh, we get d2 psi by dx squared plus now um, we are going to get, uh, if we bring this e psi term over to the left, multiply that by minus 2m over h bar squared, we get a 2me over h bar squared um, times psi. Um, I'm going to factor out a psi, and then our potential term v times psi is now going to be minus, well, if you take half m omega squared and multiply it by minus uh, 2m over h bar squared, the twos cancel, and you get m squared omega squared and times x squared divided by h bar squared and that also has a factor of psi so I've factored out that psi there and now I've put everything on one side so that's all equal to zero. So what we want to do is introduce some new variable let's call it y and it's just going to be a rescaled version of x so y is just some constant alpha times x and the goal is to work out what alpha should be in order to make the Schrodinger equation take on a particularly simple form. The one thing we've got to be a little bit careful with here is that if we want to express the equation purely in terms of y without involving any x's, uh, we also have to redefine the wave function, right? So the, originally the wave function was psi of x, but now we're going to say it's some other function phi of y, right? So technically those are different functions, psi and phi, because they're functions of different variables. So we've got to be careful with this. And the reason why this is important will become clear when we differentiate both sides of that equation there, right? So if we differentiate both sides with respect to x, we get that d psi by dx is d phi 
by dx. But then we use the chain rule um, and say, well, d5 by dx is d5 by dy times dy by dx. You can imagine those dy's cancelling there, right? Now, from the definition of y, dy by dx is just alpha. And so that derivative is simply alpha times d5 by dy. And then we can just repeat that same process again, differentiate a second time, and by exactly the same logic, we bring down another factor of alpha, right? So d2 psi by dx squared is going to be alpha squared times d2 phi by dy squared. That's why we've got to be careful with this redefining the wave function is because it affects the second order derivative, which itself appears in the Schrodinger equation. So if we substitute those results into our Schrodinger equation, the second order derivative term is now alpha squared d2 phi by dy squared. Um, then we get plus, I'm just going to copy that whole bracketed factor because um, we're going to leave that as it is for now and just put that there. Um, but now instead of psi, I'm just going to put phi here. Phi is the function of y, right? So that's all equal to zero. So what we're going to then do is get rid of this alpha squared, divide the whole equation by alpha squared and see what happens. So you get d2 phi by dy squared. Your first term in the brackets is now 2me over alpha squared, h bar squared. Now your second term, well, we want to get rid of this x here as well. x is, from the definition of y, x is just y divided by alpha. So x squared is y squared over alpha squared. But then we've divided by that alpha squared at the front as well. And so overall, we've divided by alpha to the power of 4 on that second term. So this is going to become, in terms of y, m squared omega squared y squared over alpha to the 4 times h bar squared um, multiplied by phi. And now we've expressed our Schrodinger equation in terms of our rescaled variable y. Now at the moment, this actually looks a little bit more complicated than what we started with. However, here's where we can start to simplify uh, our equation. We can now choose what alpha should be in order to make the simplification happen, right? So if you think about it, we choose alpha to the 4 to be equal to m squared omega squared divided by h squared, right? So let me just write that down. If we choose alpha to the 4 to be m squared omega squared divided by uh, h bar squared, um, then the prefactor of y squared, right, the second term in, those, in, in the brackets, is just going to be 1. Um, that's equivalent to saying that alpha is the square root of m omega over h bar. So if we choose alpha to be square root of m omega over h bar, then the second term in the brackets is just minus y squared. Um, what does that imply about the first term in the brackets? Well, let's say then um, your 2me over alpha squared h bar squared. Uh, let's write that as, let's leave the 2me over h bar squared um, as it is. Uh, your 1 over alpha squared, right, again from the definition of alpha, is going to be h bar over m omega. The m's cancel, one of the h bars uh, cancels as well, and that simplifies to 2e over h bar omega. This is just a, basically a rescaled version of the energy e, right? So we could just introduce another rescaled variable and say that is um, epsilon, like our rescaled energy is called, called epsilon. So the conclusion of all this is we end up with the equation d2 phi by dy squared plus, now we've just got this rescaled epsilon minus y squared times phi is equal to zero. That's a much more simple looking equation than the Schrodinger equation that we started with up at the top left there, right? I should note down at the end, just so we've got a nice summary of our results, where y is equal to the square root of m omega over h bar um, times x. That was our... Uh, our version of alpha that simplified the equation. And another way of looking at the process that we've just gone through is that we've basically removed the dimensions from the equation. If you go through, if you think about the dimensions of mass and angular frequency omega and um, Planck's constant, which has units of dimensions of energy times time, um, if you just play around with the units there, you should be able to convince yourself that the square root of m omega over h bar has dimensions of um, inverse length, right? And so if you times x by something with dimensions of inverse length, you get a dimensionless variable. So y doesn't have dimensions. And similarly for epsilon, right? Epsilon is a dimensionless variable as well. Anyway, now that we've rescaled our equation, made it look a lot simpler, in the next video in this series, we're going to start actually solving it. So I'll see you again soon.